From a late night radio station in Carmel, California, it's the IGN DigiGuys. Please welcome two guys who won't play Misty for me, Wade Major and Mark Kaiser. And uh, we're outside again. With, <laughs> yeah. The first week went so well. It was so well received. <laughs> we decided to try it one more time. The uh, hope is we that go. we iron this out. Yes. So that the listener gets enjoyment out of it. Yes. So it's not just Wade and Mark mixing it up yeah. by going outside versus inside. Maybe just we'll to go to a mall. Maybe, maybe, like we'll do a live remote from a mall. We'll just take a card table to, uh, I don't know, the West Side Pavilion. and just set up by the, like right in the middle without a permit, nothing. Just start, just go. We should do the show see from... If, see if any security guards come and try to... Try to fr- ooh, a yacht. Okay, stop. Yeah, that. sorry. We should do the show from a listener's home. That's a nice yacht. Check it out. Huh? That's a nice yacht. It's, it's a very nice yacht. All right, yeah. what, what, what are we talking about? I wonder where they're going. We're talking about the Oscar-winning oh. film for oh, Best yes. Foreign... Oscar-winning Best well, Foreign Film. Before we get we'll to that, that... No, before we get to that, what? Mark, we've yes. we got to talk about the, 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 the swag that you and I got this week. Um... Well, hang on, why don't, why don't well, you, why don't you take, a, take a picture of me with a swag and I'll post it on yes, Facebook. Yes, I'll do that. I, I'm, so you, you, I'm setting up the shot. You tell us what this is. Yeah, okay. I hope some pelicans go by. Wait. Be sweet. Okay. You, you're supposed to talk while this is oh, happening. Oh, right? I'm talking. Yes, yeah, sorry. I, I violated every cardinal rule of... Uh, okay, there we go. I took a picture of you looking through a little tiny camera. So, sometimes Wade and I get... Um, Gets, it's a terrible picture. Sometimes Wade, it's too dark. Sometimes Wade and I get swag. <laughs> yes, we right? do. Now, uh, we used to get a lot more swag. At least I used to get more swag than I get now. Yes. I don't know if you get less swag than you used to get. Uh, it feels like the swag train has kind of slowed down. Yes. Yes. So we get uh, uh, a little box in the mail. Yes. And the box uh, contains... Anytime, anytime we get a box in the mail... That's small, that's too small to contain a DVD or a Blu-ray. My thought always is, okay, what are you trying to sell me? What are you, what are you, what, how are you trying to bribe me? And what, what odd little bizarre tidbitty thing? Seagulls. It, it, it's, you know what, it's usually like a slide whistle or a kazoo or something that we yeah. have no use for. Yeah. So we open this up and it is a, uh, it is a miniature rubber 35 millimeter uh, SLR camera. Yeah, which I thought I, I thought really, I mean, and, and a letter from Ben Stiller urging us to go see the Secret Life of Walter Mitty, which doesn't open for what another two months or something. That is right. Now this yeah. uh, this letter reads in part: Thanks for your interest in the Secret Life of Walter Mitty. Uh, Some I, thoughts. I didn't as have to any why, interest in it. Neither did I. Some thoughts as to why I made this movie. And he goes on to talk about yeah. uh, reading James Thurber's uh, short story as a kid in school and liking it a lot. Right. And the script uh, that he got was amazing and all this sort of stuff. But all we really care about is the swag. And I'm looking at this um, miniature rubber 35-millimeter um, single-lens and, and, reflex and camera. My thought, and my thought was, this, what is most, this? this is the most useless piece of crap I've ever seen. And until Mark came over and made me feel like an imbecile, I, I had no well, idea what it was. Well, I, I just I, thought it was a rubber camera, a little, a little miniature rubber camera that didn't function well what i did was <laughs> i looked at it and i thought maybe it was a spy camera maybe there was something going on there no and then i realized and then i started pulling on the lens part and i realized to myself either i'm going to break this thing or it's going to reveal its purpose <laughs> so i pulled on the lens cap and it's a jump drive oh there we go That's and uh, so we now have a secret life of walter mitty rubberized 35 millimeter yeah, single fair. lens reflex camera jump drive. I was going to throw this thing out until you came over and put, now I'm like No, because oh, you didn't know it was a jump drive. I had no idea. You literally had not pulled that thing off. No. no. I, I, For I, once, I, I've outsmarted you. You did. Thank you. Because I looked at it and I was like okay, there's nothing, nothing, nothing moves on this. Because I didn't pull on it. I, I tried twisting it. See? You're a pull person, I'm a twist person. Well, I pulled on it again thinking I'm either going to yeah. break it in which case who cares because it's stupid or yeah, it will it reveal, reveal whatever it's going to be. Yeah. Well, all right. All right, so anyway, here's who we have, have, you a great tra- have you seen the trailer for Mitty? I have. What do you think? It looks interesting. Yeah. Why yeah, not? Yeah. It looks like, I mean, it's, it's a novel take. It's not a remake. It's kind of a reimagining. It's, it's a, adapting the, the source material in a completely different way. So, I don't think the Danny Kaye film is so untouchable that you can't remake It's a Danny Kaye Walter, film. Walter Mitty. Uh, it's, it's a Danny Kaye film. It's, it's, a, it's Yeah, it is what it is. You can remake it. Yeah. So we're talking about DVDs. We have uh, HBO yes. shows that are great. We have cable, basic cable shows that aren't so great. We have uh, the Oscar-winning Best Foreign Film of uh, last year to talk about, and all sorts of other crazy yes, stuff, Yes, we Wade. do. Yes, we do. And uh, we are going to start it all off with documentaries, just to get them out of the way. 
but some of them are really, really good. You do that while I read. Um, no, you're gonna you're oh. gonna tell you're gonna tell us about that one because you're a big fan of that. I think, aren't you? <laughs> I am. Aren't you? Weren't you a fan of West of Memphis? Sure. It's terrific. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, there were. I will. I will set this up. There were two documentaries last year about the uh, West Memphis Five, and one was the one that was produced by uh, Ken Burns and uh, primarily spearheaded by his daughter, and then there was this one. This was uh, which I think is better. By, it is better. Presented by Peter Jackson and uh, Fran Walsh. Uh, yes, that's the Peter Jackson. Uh, this is called West of Memphis, and uh, it is a chronicle of one of the most horrible, heinous, you know, miscarriages of justice ever. Yeah. And it's all about uh, trying to keep uh, the state of Arkansas from uh, killing a guy who, frankly, was innocent. And there's been a lot of uh, documentaries like this, and I know that in, I believe it's in Illinois, they have like the Innocence Project, which helps get... Uh, innocent men off of death row. I actually had a, which I've talked about on the show before, um, I had a run-in with a uh, guy. I was producing a talk show, and um, we had on our show a couple guys, three guys, who were all let out of death row at the same time for a murder they, they all three collectively did not commit. And I remember at the time, I don't know if new listeners might not re- remember the story, it was interesting because two of the guys, uh, this was in Illinois, two of the guys got on a plane, and came out to Los Angeles to be interviewed on this talk show I did. And the third guy refused to come to Los Angeles because he thought it would be ironic that he survives 17 years on death row and gets out only to die in a plane crash on his way to a TV interview. Right. So the guy just refused to get on a plane. So we interviewed two guys live in the studio and one guy via remote from Illinois. Wow. And anyway, West of Memphis is just another one of these tales, and it's just it's just riveting stuff. I mean, Peter Jackson, you know, again, he, you know, he's putting his name on it, but still, uh, I really wonder what would happen if Jackson decided to make documentaries. Yeah, uh, it, it could be really be, interesting. It could be. Uh, Storm Surfers 3D is a really it's it, this is very simple. It's exactly what it sounds. Uh, this is a Blu-ray 3D combo pack, so you get a Blu-ray, 3D Blu-ray, and uh, the uh, standard and uh, you know the standard and the 3D definition. Uh, the I'm going to do that again. You get the standard high def and the 3D high def versions of the film uh, on here as well together on a Blu-ray 3D and a regular Blu-ray. And basically, this this is just an excuse to um, get an awful lot of really cool surfing footage in 3D. And I'm normally a real big uh, I'm a, I'm really down on 3D as everybody knows. But you know what? These guys they go they they hunt storms in the Pacific. And then they go and they surf the waves generated by the storms. They're just they're just kamikaze surfers, and they threw on these uh, these super cool little micro 3D cameras, and so you feel like you're See, right that's there. That's cool. Those those little it's micro cool. cameras that they put on it's their heads really when they're cool. going through the tube. That's it. That's it's, cool. It's cool stuff. And honestly, uh, does it justify a whole movie? Well, it does if Tony Collette narrates it, because that's really the only thing that kept me going. I mean, I don't care about surfing because I went to school with surfers my whole life. So. I uh, grew up with them, so surfing is is kind of boring to me. But um, you know what? I uh, I thought this was I thought this was really sharp. Uh, Wade, we have uh, three uh, DVDs that have been packaged into one box set. This is called uh, Bill Moyer's Faith and Reason Collection. This uh, this collects three of his uh, older DVDs uh, on faith and reason, the wisdom of faith, and Amazing Grace. And I actually found the best one of these, Amazing Grace, not because it's a great documentary per se, but it's all about the song. Yeah. Amazing Grace, how it came to be, who wrote yeah. the song, why it's so powerful, how it came to be. And uh, and the great thing about it is that it includes these great performances of the song by like Johnny Cash and, uh, and uh, Judy Collins. So Amazing Grace, I thought was the best of these three. There's also uh, a faith, uh, The Wisdom of Faith with Houston Smith, who is one of the great um, comparative religion uh, scholars. That's interesting, too. But uh, ultimately, if you're, it's probably like more for your parents yeah. if you like this kind of stuff. But I thought Amazing Grace was interesting. Yeah, totally. I, I, I always love that stuff. I, you know, he, sometimes his subjects are more interesting than other times, but yeah, whatever. And then uh, just a few docs to wrap out that all have kind of eco packaging. You like that transition? You, you oh, know, whatever. Whatever. Bill Moyers, he's a guy. He does he does docs yeah. and he talks about yeah. stuff and it's kind of cool. Whatever. Yeah, dedicate our life to these things. Whatever. Yeah, yeah it's fine. Uh, we got one from um, the uh, Sloft Fun Foundation or the Slot Foundation. I'm not entirely sure how you pronounce it, but uh, this is actually pretty cool. This is uh, utterly precarious. A master class with Carolee Schneeman, uh, the Mutter Museum of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. 
recorded on April 25th, 2012. This sounds, that, that sounds really And you're thinking, just oh my gosh, this is just the most boring thing ever, right? Yes. Uh, no, it's not. This is, this is actually, uh, a, it's very scholastic, but it's an exchange between uh, Carolee Schneeman and students at the University of Philadelphia. Whoa, whoa, you're telling me that I've actually lived in an era when I can buy a DVD with a conversation between Carolyn Schneeman Carolee Schneeman and a bunch of students from Carole the University Schneeman, of Philadelphia? Carolee Schneeman is a multimedia artist. Oh, my God. And if you've ever seen any of her, her um, installations, they're really cool. They're, like, cool and freaky. It's like... You know, I, I just installed a microwave oven in like, my house. It's, it's fantastic. It's like Tim Burton meets David Lynch meets, you know, I don't know... Uh, Schleeman? Uh, I don't know, Jess Franco. So, anyway... <laughs> um, Seriously, you like this thing? It's pretty. I didn't cool. watch. I don't know. I, it, I no, it's it. it's cool. She's like she's very she's very you know uh, artsy. She's very uh, into her thing. Is she's she like more a, artsy or fartsy? She, uh, fartsy. She's like a Woody Allen character. And uh, it's Schleeman. What's her name? Carolee Schneeman. Okay, enough with you. <laughs> and then the last three docs that we have here are all from uh, First Run Features, which is now releasing most of its docs in the in the in the slimline eco packaging. We've got uh, Living Downstream, Boom Varietal, and, uh, and Dutch, the ma- Master of the Forges of Hell. Uh, the one that I really want to make- recommend here is the latter one, which is by uh, Cambodian filmmaker Riti Pan. And uh, Riti Pan is an unbelievable filmmaker. If you've never heard of him, I've seen a number of his films, mostly at festivals. They d- almost never get released here. Um, Rice People was the first one that I saw back in the 90s which is just the most depressing movie ever. It's about this family that works the rice paddies in Cambodia, and then one day, uh, mom gets a splinter in her foot, and truly, it literally destroys the entire family. Like, the sequence of events, from the, it's, just, it's just dreadfully depressing, but really good. Um, any, uh, anyway, and, I'm, and I, I'm not pronouncing, you know, Dutch, Duk, I, I'm not pronouncing it correctly, because I don't speak Cambodian. But anyway, the name, it's not Dutch, the name, it, it comes from... Um, the Khmer Rouge leader, who was the very first one who came before the International Criminal Court, uh, where he was sentenced to life in prison. And uh, this is um, a follow-up to the, uh, the movie that Riti Pan made previously, S-21, The Khmer Rouge Killing Machine, which uh, together they, they represent just this amazing expose of the horrors of the Khmer Rouge and what happened to Cambodia between 75 and 79. Two million people slaughtered at the hands of the, uh, the Khmer Rouge. I mean, it's just, it's just so, so depressing. And uh, this, is, uh, this includes uh, Riti Pan's in-depth interview with, uh, with, you know, the title character, the title guy. And it's just, uh, it's amazing. It's like, if you thought, what was the, the Errol Morris thing where he talks to uh, McNamara? What was that called? The, 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 the Fog of War. Fog of War. This is very Fog of War-ish, except your subject is just, is a, is a horrible, horrible, just unbelievable murderer. Like, McNamara is, is like an angel compared to this guy. So, uh, anyway, very sharp. Really, really, um, it's really cool. Really good movie. And then uh, Living Downstream is uh, based on a book by the ecologist and cancer survivor Sandra Steingraber. And uh, it's, uh, you know, about this year traveling across uh, North America trying to figure out uh, all the problems that, you know, the the whole, this whole litany of environmental problems. Lovely photography, very nicely done. And then uh, Boom Varietal, uh, The Rise of Argentine Malbec. I know what you're thinking, Mark. What the hell is that about? Uh, the Malbec is a grape that was originally from France that now grows primarily in Argentina. And uh, this is all basically a wine documentary that goes along with another wine documentary that we'll be talking about in a future week. But um, it's, uh, this is a cool, cool, you know, if you're, if, I'm not into wine, but I, uh, I find the, the history of grape to be f- just truly fascinating. I do. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> the history of grapes. The history of grapes are amazing. They're wonderful. <laughs> the history of the Malbec grape. It, you, you you laugh at me as if I'm making a joke. I'm I'm so serious. I you you, could, you watch those. I, I didn't watch them. Yeah. I, anyway, yes. Uh, I, I I watch most of them. All right, we're going to talk about some foreign language films. Mark, go. We are going to talk about some foreign language films. We're going to talk about the foreign language film. Of 2012, which is to say the Oscar winner for yeah. Best Foreign Language Film. This is Amor, the new film from Michael Haneke, who is absolutely at the top of his game. This Austrian director is just unbelievably fantastic. This is, I, you, know, you know why this film is so powerful? I've decided there's a reason why hmm. this film, which is about a, a longtime married couple, they're now well into their 70s, um, the wife gets sick. She, has, she basically has a stroke. and the husband has to take care of her. The reason why this movie is so great is because of the name. It's true. 
because really, when you think yeah. about it, you know, when the the uh, the wife played by Emmanuel Riva, she gets sicker and sicker, and she gets more and more debilitated, and she's probably going to die, and the husband has to take care of her, and do all those horrible things that you got to do when you take care of people at the end of life. You realize that that is what love is. Yeah, love is. is not just you know romance and 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 from here to eternity. That's a really good point. You know, this is the ultimate expression of love, even more than saying I love you or kissing on the beach or long walks on the sand, whatever yeah. it is. This really is what love is. Yeah. And so I think that a lot of the power of the film was really just the the misdirect of the title and how it really is just the ultimate expression of love that these two people go through, and it's great. I could not be uh, in more agreement. Now, by the way, it does say Best Picture of the Year, Los Angeles Film Critics Association. Oh, yeah. We were in the room when that happened, weren't we? We were in the room when that happened. We were also in the room when uh, Emmanuel Riva... Yes. Tied for Best Actress with Jennifer Lawrence. That was pretty cool. That was cool. That Actually, was really, should, should, should I tell the story? Yeah, go ahead. I should tell the story? Tell the story. It's a bit of an inside baseball story. It's okay. Here's the situation. In the voting for Best Actress at the LA Film Critics Association uh, voting last year, it was a neck-and-neck -neck race. Yep. It was Emmanuel Riva for Amour, and it was Jennifer Lawrence for Silver Linings Playbook. Yes. Back and forth, back yep. and forth. Yep. The winner, by a vote, ladies and gentlemen, your new winner... Jennifer Lawrence. Mm. Oh, my God. Well, Jennifer Lawrence wins, and all the Emmanuel Riva people, which I was one, yeah. all start flipping out because we want Emmanuel Riva to win because Jennifer Lawrence is like seven years old, <laughs> and that movie sucks, and I don't care what people think, and she'll win it again because we all love Jennifer Lawrence, and yeah. she's great, and she'll win ten Oscars by the time she's done. But this is Emmanuel Riva, who was, you know, Hiroshima, Hiroshima, uh, Hiroshima Mon Amour, yep. and what, what you got to give it to her. So then, at the very last minute, <laughs> after it was already decided that Jennifer Lawrence won... One of our members, who will remain nameless, not wait or I, yeah. changed his vote just to shut the room up. And make it a tie. And made it a tie. Yeah. So it was a tie. It was pretty sweet. And it was sweet. And it, it allowed me to uh, take our friend Phil Klein to the uh, Los Angeles Film Critics dinner so that uh, I can have uh, 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 Phil have his picture taken next to yeah. Jennifer Lawrence. So the next movie here is called Post Tenebra Lux, uh, which means light after darkness. This is from the Mexican director Carlos Regadas. Uh, here's the thing. This one best director at Cannes, I understand why. It's, it's got that whole, you know, lingering, uh, poetic, uh, never-ending photographic signature that Ray Goddess does in all of his movies, like Hapon he did previously, and uh, Battle in Heaven, which uh, it, it, we famously discussed on this show, because uh, when, <laughs> when I showed Mark the opening shot of uh, Battle in Heaven, which turns out to be uh, an, a copulatory shot, that you don't realize until a certain moment, Mark uh, gleefully exclaimed, it looks like ginger root. What did I say? It looks like a ginger root. Did I say that? You did. <laughs> I've laughed about it ever since. So anyway, uh, what are you doing? I want to take another picture of that, that camera to put on Facebook, but you oh. took a lousy picture, but it was well, too dark. Here, well, so you talk it. about this movie that I said was a ginger root movie, uh, yeah, and then here, uh, give, here, me the, give me the thing here. Here, here, we, here we go. Here's the, here's the <laughs> damn <laughs> camera. <laughs> the last two shows have been completely unscripted. So well, they're never really scripted. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> look, it's, it's basically about a family that moves to the countryside, and uh, they, they experience all of these Ingmar Bergman-esque crises that just, uh, you know, everything all falls to hell. Ingmar Bergman made a number of those movies where people move to islands and their lives just disintegrate. And this is, this is kind of one of them. Uh, I don't think this is a great film by any means. I think it's certainly better than Hapon or Battle in Heaven. I think Regattas has improved. Battle in Heaven, but that doesn't say much because Battle, he Battle in Heaven was just an unbearable ordeal to watch. That was just the, the worst thing ever. I, I mean, seriously, there's, there's nudity in that film that shouldn't even exist in the real world. Uh, so that was horrible. Um, it, it, whatever. One best director at can. Watch at your own risk. Uh, the Devil's Backbone, however, is a Criterion Edition Blu-ray that I highly recommend. Big deal. Release, folks. Rent it, totally buy it, do what you got to do. You know, uh, this is a, a film. Uh, weren't they going to do like a sequel to this? You know did, why did I don't like thought... this film? Can I tell you why I don't like this you film? You don't like this film? No, I'll tell you why I don't really? like this film. For a very, very serious Guillermo reason. Guillermo del Toro movie. Very serious reason. Really? Because, yes, because in the audio commentary for Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, my yeah. favorite movie of all time, yeah. Nicholas Meyer who did the audio commentary, the yeah. director of Star Trek II. Right. I guess he had just seen The Devil's Backbone. Right. And 
in his audio commentary, he keeps talking about the Devil's Backbone, how much he loves it. And I don't care. I want to hear about Kirk and Spock and tell me about the movie. Tell me about Star Trek. He had just seen it. I guess nah. he had just seen it recently or something. And he just yeah. kept, I'm telling you, folks, listen to the director's commentary from Nick Meyer on Star Trek II. And he will mention the Devil's Backbone 16 times. And it annoyed me because I wanted to know about how they shot the Kirk and Spock thing with the Kirk and Spock. But they didn't do it because he was a talked about Devil's Backbone. Well, that's interesting. Well, anyway, basically, <laughs> basically, Devil's Backbone is a ghost movie. It's set in the end of the uh, Spanish Civil War. A little boy loses his dad, goes to an orphanage, which is haunted. It's great. Uh, Del Toro just really, really turns the screws. It's, uh, it's beautifully made. It's not a big budget film, which means it winds up being better because of it. And uh, it's got heaps of great extras on it. Uh, you just, I mean, there's no end to it. It's, it's a Blu-ray transfer from a 2K digital film, uh, original elements. Beautiful, really, really pristine. The, the, the shading and the dark areas when you get inside the, the orphanage and all the shadows, it's just fantastic. It'll really, really show off your, uh, your, your Blu-ray player and your television. Uh, there's a great interview on here with the scholar uh, Sebastian Faber about the Spanish Civil War and the uh, degree to which the film is accurate in its representation of this particular facet of the Spanish Civil War. You get storyboards, you get uh, all kinds of really fun stuff on here. Video introduction from 2010, originally shot for the DVD release. And uh, new and archival interviews with Del Toro about the film. It's just fabulous. Really, really nice. Couldn't so, agree more. Yeah, totally. And uh, then uh, real quickly before I let Mark uh, talk about something of note, uh, I'm just going to mention Scary Movie 5, unrated. What's the point? Blu-ray, DVD, and ultraviolet. I don't get it. It, it, it. Just because there's like one scene where there's Charlie Sheen and Lindsay Lohan, I, I, and that's, ha ha, hoi. Oh, funny. And then we're done. I, I, I don't know. It's on Blu-ray. If you have no taste, you'll probably want it. And then a dreadful movie that somehow got made and released, and which does no good for either of the people. And it Rapture Palooza. Unbelievable. Craig Robinson and Anna Kendrick, the Oscar-nominated Anna Kendrick. Uh, this is just dreadful. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a stupid comedy set in suburban Seattle after a real apocalypse. And, uh, now, by the way, um, Craig Robinson also appeared in This Is The End. Oh, jeez. And I don't know if you saw This Is The End. I haven't yet. It's funny. I heard. It's a funny movie. Now, this is just horrible. Well, anyway, Craig Robinson plays the Antichrist who, who sets up shop in the, uh, the basement of this couple. It's just stupid. It's just beyond stupid. I don't know how this stuff gets made. I really don't. I guess they just signed Anna Kendrick and, and Craig Robinson, and nobody bothered questioning anything else about it. Anyway, uh, that's also DVD and ultraviolet, and uh, utterly pointless, unless you just love them so much that you'll excuse them for anything that they do. Uh, Wade, this is, a, this is a production company, Wade. Yes. It's called Millennium Films. <laughs> Tell us now, who, who runs Millennium See, but they Films? Did, they did uh, what Maisie knew as well, remember that, you know? They, 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 they make occasionally make a real movie, but yes, it's Avi Lerner and... Uh, here, here's, here's what Avi Lerner does. Yeah. We've talked about this on the show before. Yeah. This is how Avi Lerner operates a yeah. lot of the times. He makes horrible films uh, with actors like De Niro and Pacino, yeah. like he did Righteous Kill. Yeah. He's just done a lot of films. And you wonder, God, how does he get these people to be in his horrible films? I know. This is what he does. And I've heard this. This is what he does. He will send, as an example, uh, you know, Uma Thurman right. a script. Yes. And the script will be in a brown paper envelope. And, you know, they'll know. Sure. She'll, she'll know it came from um, Millennium Films. Sure. Open up the envelope, and there'll be two things in the envelope. There'll be the script, and on top of the script, there'll be a post-it. And the yes. post-it will say, as example, $3 million. Right. That's what the post-it will say. So uh, it'll yeah. say $3 million. Yep. So Uma Thurman knows that the piece of crap she's about to read, it's a piece of crap. Yeah. But she will get paid $3 million for doing it. Yep. So you got a script and a post-it with what he's going to pay you, and that's it. There you go. And that's how this guy does business. And with that, we come to the killing season which stars Robert De Niro, who has starred in a lot of Millennium films, and I just don't get it. What they, is wrong they, with him? They give him his, his, they give him his quote. I That's get, what they do. They must give him more than his quote, because, I mean, he's De Niro. He's the worst. De Niro and John Travolta. Uh, this takes place in Appalachia, and uh, De Niro plays this uh, military guy, <laughs> and uh, John Travolta, with a crazy accent, uh, plays this European, uh, quote-unquote, tourist. And it turns out that Travolta wants to hunt down uh, De Niro, and the whole thing is like this mano a mano between the two of them. And it was directed by Mark Stephen Johnson, who is not an unknown director. Yeah. But uh, still, this is just more Millennium crap, and I don't know. I could see Travolta wanting to work with Robert De Niro, and I guess I could see Robert De Niro want to open up another restaurant or two. Yeah. Uh, it's all, all I can do to explain it, but it's just very disappointing. 
The next film I'm going to talk about, I think, is awesome. And I got to tell you, you're going to you're going to think I'm crazy. People are going to go, Wade, you you've lost uh, all my respect. I I can't believe you'd actually say anything good about this movie. It looks like junk. No, I'm going to tell you, No One Lives is awesome. It is absolutely wicked awesome. And oh, <laughs> helicopter. We are not doing this again next week. Hi, hi. We're, we're, we're not doing this again next week. Okay. This is our last week on the balcony. Fewer helicopters, though, right? This week, fewer, fewer yeah. motor motor Seems noises. Like it. Yeah. Not as many seagulls or pelicans or anything. That's I miss the pelicans this week. I guess they they got their fill of you last week, and now they don't want to visit anymore. Anyway, uh, No One Lives is from WWE Entertainment. And they have a, they understand their audience very very specifically. They, they make a certain kind of thrillery action gory movie that is strictly for wrestling fans, and me, because I thought this movie was terrific. This is directed by Ruhei Kitamura, first of all, who is the Japanese director of the uh, 2003 film Azumi, which I loved. Never mind the fact that he kind of screwed up Midnight Meat Train a few years ago. Uh, Azumi is an awesome movie. And he brings the same energy to this. Now, here's the, here's, the, here's the story here. Luke Evans, okay, who I guess has some connection to wrestling. I don't really know. Don't care. I don't, you know, whatever. Luke Evans is a guy who's out in the backwater somewhere driving around with his girlfriend. And you just think they're having problems, right? It's just, oh, it's, you know, they're, they're not quite together. And there's a bunch of these thugs, these, the, this criminal gang who've been looting homes and they target him, and they're like, that guy looks like an easy mark. And there's a confrontation in a bar, right? Where they're all up in his face, all up in his grill, and they're, they're trying to intimidate him, and he's like, no, don't do that. And she tries to stop him, and you get the feeling, ooh, this guy's dangerous. He's the hero rooting for him, right? Well, then they basically, later on, they run him off the road, and they kidnap his girlfriend, and they take the car, and they leave him for dead. And you're thinking, I want him to just kick, kick butt, man. Go, Luke, you gotta go get the girl back. And then, and then... When they get the car, they open up the trunk. There's a kidnapped woman in the trunk. Turns out these psychopaths, and I'm not giving anything away here, these psychopaths have not messed with a hero. They've messed with a guy who's an even more cruel psychopath and murderer than they are. So you, you wind up with the scum of the earth. You're rooting for the guy who's the scum of the earth to destroy guys who are, you know, less palpable as scum of the earth. It's Honestly, I cannot tell you how outrageous and over-the-top and fun this movie is. The, the ways in which people are killed brutally in this movie, so creative, so lovely. It is, it is, it's one of the few gory movies that I've actually just had a blast with. No One Lives. It's on Blu-ray. It's a Blu-ray DVD combo pack. I see it. It is a riot. It is a hoot. It is a laugh and a half. All I know is that I just heard you say the words, up in his grill. <laughs> I never thought I would hear you say that. Uh, from oh, yeah. Tribeca Film comes uh, an interesting okay movie called Highland Park. This has a decent cast, including Billy Burke and Parker Posey and Danny Glover. They uh, play a bunch of guys living in uh, Highland Park, which is uh, uh, in Detroit, Detroit area. Of course, Detroit going through its own problems right now. And um, a bunch of guys get fired from the, Detro- the Detroit area high school where they all work. And But... They might win the lottery, Wade. Oh, and yeah. if they win the lottery, their lives are going to change. Yeah. But here's the thing. What? The movie's What's the thing? not that great. It's okay. Uh, I think Parker Posey was miscast here. I, I don't know if she's trying to channel Sarah <coughs> Palin or something, but she plays like this this mayor who's very ambitious and ruthless uh, yeah. and whatnot. I, I didn't really like her in this. Okay. Uh, but then again, it's kind of like Parker Posey was such like the kind of the... Um, she was such a quirky indie it girl that now that she's getting older, I don't know what she's going to do, so I guess she has to take roles like this. Uh, motorcycle in the yep. background. We have to stop doing this outside, Wade. Okay. Uh, otherwise, Holland Park, you know, it's interesting. There's some interesting uh, uh, character stuff here because once you start getting money involved, people's motives start to change and the relationships with each other start to change and that's kind of always kind of interesting. But still, Holland Park, it's okay. You know what I'd rather have you watch? Simple what? Plan. Oh. For some reason, when I was watching this, I was thinking of Simple Plan, the Billy Bob Thornton film. Well, all right. The film where Billy Bob Thornton was um, robbed uh, for yeah. best actor, uh, best supporting, best supporting actor Oscar, he was nominated, didn't get it. He should have gotten it. For some reason, I flashed on uh, Simple Plan when I was watching this movie. Much better film. All right, I uh, got some olive film titles here that I'm going to blow through as quickly as possible. Um, they're all worth uh, checking out. Actually, this is. I mean, sometimes we get some some ringery things in here with olive. You know, they they call the Paramount Library for some things that have kind of more genre interest. Uh, there might be a couple in here, but. I'll tell you, got a couple of Danny Kay movies, a couple of Bob Hope movies, all on Blu-ray. Good times. Uh, Danny Kay's Knock on Wood and On the Double. 
Uh, these are a couple of really fun films. I love Danny Kaye. I love anything he does. And, of course, we started the show off talking about our swag that we got for... Uh, the, the Ben Stiller remake of The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, which, of course, is a film, the original, that was very famously a Danny Kaye film, although not that faithful to the material. So we'll see if Ben Stiller does it a little bit more faithful. But uh, this, is, uh, this is really directed. This is directed by Norman Panama and Melvin Frank, who did The Court Jester. And uh, they got a screenplay nomination for, uh, for this film, which is really, really fun. Danny Kaye plays, get this, a neurotic American ventriloquist. I, you know what? If I see another movie about a neurotic ventriloquist, oh, I know, I'm going right? to scream. It's funny. Danny Kay, his, his parts were usually kind of sculpted for his particular brand of comedy. And the idea here is that he, he sort of has, um, he's sort of like a guy whose ventriloquist dummy has Tourette's. And is, you know, during the, the production code era, as close to Tourette's as you're going to get. Anyway, it all takes place in Europe in 1946. Um, it's basically a re The movie's from 1953 But it's a remake of a 1946 film Called Dead of Night So it has kind of an immediate uh, Pre-Cold War sensibility to it Awfully, awfully fun And then uh, On the Double Which was, which was uh, co-written by Jack Rose and Melvin Shavelson And directed by Shavelson uh, Is again a kind of a World War II era thing where uh, Danny Kay plays a soldier, Private Ernie Williams, who happens to look just like a British colonel. Fill in the comedy blanks. It's a lot of fun. Uh, this one's also really, really well, well written and just a total hoot. And then the Bob Hope films are Off Limits and My Favorite Spy. Uh, My Favorite Spy, of course, is uh, just a terrific film with Bob Hope and Hedy Lamarr that's been on DVD many, many times. A lot of them public domain releases. This is a 1951 film now on Blu-ray. And it is wonderful. S oddly enough, a somewhat similar story to uh, On the Double. And uh, in this case, uh, Bob Hope is, a, is a, just a regular guy who looks exactly like a spy. And uh, he has to actually uh, impersonate that spy, and it's a, it's a lot of fun. He looks exactly like... A spy. A spy. In a world. And uh, Off Limits co-stars uh, Marilyn Maxwell and Mickey Rooney. Mickey Rooney and Bob Hope together is almost a combustible combination that makes the universe come to uh, a stop. Um, Bob Hope actually shows up Mickey Rooney in this. And uh, Bob Hope plays a boxing trainer. And uh, Mickey Rooney plays an amateur boxer. And again, you could just fill in the comedy there. Marilyn Maxwell is really just there for eye candy. George Marshall, who did Fancy Pants as the director. It's a lot of fun. Did you read the, uh, not read or even, even read reviews of the Ava Gardner book? I've read some of the stuff. It's like, ooh. Mickey Rooney? I don't need to know that. Mickey Rooney? Comes off like a pedophile, I guess, he, right? <laughs> he really does. What is he, like chasing around 12-year-olds? He's chasing around preteen girls, I mean, uh, teenage girls, yeah. and he's sleeping with everybody. He's like, Mickey Rooney? Yeah. He's like everybody's grandfather. And well, Mickey Rooney was like a skirt chasing... In the world! The Dana Carvey thing you've seen in the Mickey Rooney? I was the biggest star in the world. <laughs> Great. And then a few other ones here. Uh, the uh, Kind of an exploitation film. Uh, Anthony Dexter, Susan Shaw, Paul Carpenter. Three people you never heard of in Fire Maidens of Outer Space. Fire, Fire Maidens. This is a 1956 uh, kind of B-movie. And uh, it's about some astronauts who... who <laughs> I can't even... Mark... This movie, I'm going to try to be as serious as I can. This is a movie about a group of astronauts who um, discover this, this kind of semi-nude race of women from Atlantis on a Jupiterian moon. Isn't that fascinating? A Jupiterian mood? It's like they made it up as they went along. Anyway, See, that's... The thing is that whenever I go into space, I always wind up landing on planets with fully clothed women. It's just unbelievable. It's just not fair. It, it's, uh, it's utterly silly and totally pointless, but it's got that 1950s uh, sheen to it. Uh, a couple of... Um, Let's see here. Uh, another John Wayne movie. They've been releasing a lot of Jane, John Wayne stuff. This is one of the more famous uh, John Wayne movies from the 1940s, Angel and the Bad Man, along with Gail Russell. Uh, pretty decent film. It's Again, this has been on public domain uh, DVD releases for decades. I mean, this has been out there just forever. It's been like, um, there have to be at least 30 or 40 releases of this thing, and they all look like crap. This actually looks really great. Uh, Olive did a beautiful job getting the original elements out of Paramount, putting them on Blu-ray. It's very nice, really nice. Uh, you know, not one of Wayne's better westerns, but certainly one of his more popular westerns. And then three more legendary male stars here, real quickly. Uh, Robert Stock stars as a skeet shooting champion in Bullfighter and the Lady. 
Um, uh, you know, it's basically a skeet shooting champion who uh, is exposed, to, who's introduced to, you know, bullfighting and, um, you know, fill in the rest of the blanks there yourself. It's a, it's a really nice Bud Boddicker movie. Bud Boddicker didn't make a lot of movies like this, but this one's actually kind of fun. Gary Cooper in the Court Martial of Billy Mitchell from Otto Preminger. Uh, like most Otto Preminger movies, really well directed, really well acted, and uh, features a surprisingly, kind of a surprising stretch for Gary Cooper. He uh, plays a, um, an American war hero. That's a stretch. Yeah, that's a stretch, isn't it? Yeah. He only does that in every other <laughs> movie he plays. It's like, it's like, yeah, it's a, like he, in Wings, he had like no lines of dialogue. He was yeah. like an American war hero. Uh, he's an American war hero in at least two-thirds of his movies. Uh, but anyway, Otto Preminger really, really does a great, uh, a great job with this. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a court-martial movie, so it's kind of like a big expanded version of the Star Trek episode court-martial, except without William Shatner and a better actor in the part. And then uh, Cary Grant and Doris Day are just wonderful in Delbert Mann's That Touch of Mink, which is, you know, one of those uh, romantic comedies from the 1960s that you can watch over and over and over and over again. It's just delightful. I, uh, I, I have a blast with this movie. It's just, it's, it's fluffy, it's utterly pointless, uh, and Delbert Mann knows that every step of the way. But it's just fun, you know? It's Gary Cooper and Doris Day. They could just be standing there talking to each other and making goo-goo eyes, and I'd love it. So, yeah, there right. you go. All right, Mark, tell us about, uh, oh, good grief, redemption, redemption titles from... Uh, well, here's the thing. From yeah. Kino Lord. Well, here's the thing. Yeah. About a few months ago, Jess Stone died. Uh, Je- Jess Stone. Jess Franco died. Now, Jess yes. Franco is a prolific um, Spanish low-budget film director from the 60s and 70s. Uh, Jess Franco, not his real name. I think his real name was Jesus Franco, actually. Um, but he died. He was pretty old. I think he was in his 80s. He died a few months ago. And uh, so Kino Lorber... Uh, they might have rushed these out uh, to take advantage of the, uh, the uh, added attention on uh, the late Mr. Franco. They came up with uh, three of his most popular films on DVD and Blu-ray. These, it's, these are separate DVDs and separate Blu-rays. These are not packaged as one. They did come out with um, the, the awful Dr. Orloff, which was uh, from 1962, I think, which is kind of his first big splash, uh, yeah. Jess Franco's. And it got pretty decent stateside uh, distribution. Um, this is, uh, his the thing with Franco is that he had a very interesting visual style. He was sort of like a pre giallo giallo kind of a guy. And the movie stars this guy, uh, Howard Vernon, he plays his surgeon who, uh, you know, lures beautiful women into, uh, into his uh, operating room and does horrible things to them. In fact, he does awful things to them. Orful. That's why they call him Orloff, the, the, the or- awful, awful, awful or- Dr. Orloff. Can't say, that, that works? Can't, can't say that ten times fast. Now, we also, from Jess Franco, have Nightmares Come at Night. Uh, this is from 19... 19- oh, do they really? They do. <laughs> it's like yeah. stating the obvious. What? If they, and, and like an interesting movie title would be Nightmares Come During the Day. Nightmares Come at Night? What, oh, shock me. It's called My Life. Walking People? For, Stroll. From, 19, <laughs> from 1970, this is, uh, this is about a dancer who... This, it's, it's like a mind control thing with a dancer who starts a mind control. This blonde woman played yeah. by uh, Colette Gia Combine. And that one's okay. Uh, yeah. The funniest one to me, because it's just so ridiculous, is called A Virgin Among the Living Dead. Now, this one is just very strange. It's supposedly, like, all erotic, but I'm telling you, uh, from 1973, not really erotic. I did like the audio commentary by Tim Lucas because I felt of all of these, uh, it was the one that sort of best encapsulated why Jess Franco was popular and the time in which he, uh, in which he worked. Um, of course, because this is Kino Lorber, they do a great job with the extras on films that you just assumed were otherwise just completely forgotten. Um, there's a 16-minute interview with Jess Franco uh, from back in the day. There's a 12-minute documentary on the making of the film, and so it's good stuff. I would go for, uh, if, you're, if you're into Jess Franco, you definitely got to go for uh, the awful uh, Dr. Orloff. That was his biggest film, released stateside. And then A Virgin Amongst the Living Dead is the second best because it's the stupidest. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, and then a couple before we get uh, into television here. The Odd Angry Shot is a really interesting new release from Synapse that is kind of a forgotten uh, 1979 Australian film about the Vietnam War. And it, I, you always forget Australians fought in the Vietnam War as well. Like, yeah, but they, they didn't. Yeah, they, uh, yeah. They, they like fed people. They didn't really like uh, uh, well, shoot people. And it, it, I made that up. I have no idea. I know. It, it, well, but it, it sounds good. Uh, anyway, this is uh, this was made by um, the director Tom Jeffrey, who I'm not that familiar with, but apparently this has some kind of high profile in Australia. It's made in 1979, so it's uh, it's kind of bumping up against Apocalypse Now on a global scale, which I guess is why we've probably never heard of it. You know, it's it's the year after the. Uh, 
the uh, the Deer Hunter and the same year as Apocalypse Now. It's easy to you know be the Vietnam film from Australia that just gets lost in the mix. Uh, but anyway, it's it's not bad. It's a little bit like Platoon. Uh, it's about a you know a bunch of it, or the the Big Red One if you want to go to uh, Samuel Fuller's World War II film. It's a platoon of guys, and um, they're you know they're they're jovial until the war sobers them up. And it's pretty straightforward, pretty simple, decently done. Has kind of a B movie feel in some ways, but um, definitely worth checking out. Certainly, uh, certainly you know a worthwhile film from the era. And lastly, we have a double feature. Uh, I just don't know if I recommend this or not. Uh, the Hot Spot along with Killing Me Softly. This is a, uh, a Shout Factory double feature of two films that are terribly, terribly unfortunate. That's the best way that I can put this. Uh, great directors doing unbelievably strange work in almost a softcore field. The Hot Spot uh, is from Dennis Hopper. It uh, was kind of an attempt for, uh, to get his directing career back on track after many, many years of not making movies. And uh, it's, you know, Don Johnson and uh, Virginia Madsen just being hot and Jennifer Connelly being, well, a lot less professional than she's been in uh, subsequent years. Uh, the, uh, the other film, Killing Me Softly, is just this bizarre... I don't think it even got a theatrical release. Chen Kaiga after he had won uh, the Palme d'Or and been you know, an Oscar nominee many, many times, decided to segue away from sophisticated Chinese films and make this bizarre erotic thriller with Joseph Fiennes and Heather Graham that is almost laughable, it's so bad. I don't know if it's a language problem, I don't know if he just was, d didn't care and was taking a, a paycheck. But the only noteworthy thing about this is, uh, is a terrific music score from Patrick Doyle, who of course does all of the... Uh, the uh, Kenneth, Kenneth, Bra Kenneth Branagh the stuff. Kenneth Branagh stuff. Yeah. So anyway, those those two are on a double feature. It's it's a weird double feature. If you want to watch a couple of great directors do really strange work in uh, in an almost softcore genre, there it is. Whatever. All right, Mark. Television. Boardwalk Empire, the complete third season. This show. You know what's funny about Boardwalk Empire? No, although Boardwalk Empire is great, and it's uh, Terrence Winter knocks it out of the park. It's got an amazing cast. I kind of feel like. This show is a little under the radar. It still it still feels a little under the radar. It feels doesn't it? like yeah. there's other shows like um, the Kevin Spacey thing, uh, House of Cards. Yeah, you know, and even Orange Is the New Black. Everyone's talking about. You know, I haven't and, seen that. How is that? I know people that love that show. Uh, it's you know it's pretty mixed. Uh, people do love that show. You know, um, but I think with Boardwalk Empire is that I feel like it's not really getting that cultural groundswell. People talking about it, thinking yeah. about it, writing about it. That the other show, I think in the first couple seasons maybe more now it's sort of you know it's kind of in in in, in early middle age let's say and um it's not really hitting the zeitgeist but it's still a good show still takes place in atlantic city in the early 20s and uh you know it's still steve buscemi is nucky thompson and so it's good it's good stuff and there's also terrific extras on it so if you have the first two seasons um of boardwalk empire you have to get this season four premieres uh it premieres in a couple months i think in the fall but uh, there you go. So HBO looks good on Blu-ray. It's great um, uh, audio commentaries and documentaries and whatnot. So if you like the show, go for it. You know, I just think that I, I wish this. I wish like Scorsese would like direct all of season four, or just or just do so just you know do what Game of Thrones did. Just start killing people off, so hey, that people just start talking about it. What do you what, have you, uh, what do you think about Low Winter Sun? I have not seen it. It's good. Is it? It's good. Mark Strong. It's you know it's originally a UK series. Well, Mark Strong's and that, terrific, and now they and now he's playing the same character, but they transplanted it from the UK to Detroit. And uh, I got to tell you, AMC man, they they they're they're doing some interesting stuff. I like that. You know, look, yeah. uh, you know, we because way down you know, critics. You, you know, Sherman is uh, Tim's friend. Sherman is is, is uh, going to be on the show mid season. Oh, really? Yeah, as, as like my, season uh, episode five or six, he shows up. Oh, good for him. Yeah, but you know, way now obviously film critics, so we we care about and write about film, past, present, and future, yep. but even we have to admit that on TV right now there's some great stuff going on, because yeah. movies suck. Yeah, they do. <laughs> uh, we get with three little best of compilations from the, uh, from the A&E group, two of them from History Channel, one of them from A&E. I don't know why they even call it History Channel anymore. Everything on the Learning Channel is like, 
is like uh, Buddy Yum Yum, Zoe Goo Goo, whatever the hell that damn show Bravo? is. Bravo? Remember yeah. when Bravo was Bravo like... Bravo was like know, sophisticated, it, yeah. and now History Channel has, you know, American Pickers and Pawn Stars. I, I, don't, I don't know why they even re maintain the titles of these networks anymore. <laughs> just call it like Network 360 or Network 12, and then just put whatever you want on. Anyway, uh, these are all little best of compilations. One is the best of Storage Wars, the best of American Pickers, and the best of Pawn Stars. See, uh, the, the reason why I like these DVDs hmm. is because... You know that if somebody were to buy these DVDs, you know that they need to be sent away to some yes. sort of a camp or, or yeah. some sort of part of the country where they can just go off and, and inbreed and do whatever, the, do whatever they do. Because do you really want somebody who says, guess what I bought? I went to the store today and I bought the best of American pickers. Yeah, I know. And I cannot wait <laughs> to go home and pound that down. Yeah. It, do you really want to know that person? No, I don't. I, I don't. I, look... Uh, the, these shows are just, they're about, you know, kind of rednecky middle American people who do weird things like, you know, uh, pawn shop stuff and recycling and uh, going to storage containers and bidding on the crap in them. I mean, it's, you know, it's like, it's, it's sort of reality television for the, 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 the you know, the, the garage sale set. It's just low-hanging fruit. Look, there's a it's guy who does fruit. something interesting. Yeah, Let's exactly. give him a show. Whatever. Look, so there's anyway. a guy. He makes avocados. He picks avocados. Let's <laughs> call avocado pickers. It's, but it's, it's about junk. You know, it's like uh, if you collect a lot of crap and you got a lot, a lot of crap in your garage, you relate to these people because they all kind of deal and trade in crap. So, anyway. Speaking of crap, uh, NCIS, 10th uh, oh, season. It's, 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 stop that. It's, it's a good it's, show. Mark Harmon, uh, this guy must be so guy. rich and nobody cares about him. I know. Except, like, if you're one of the, like, five million people who watch this show yeah. religiously, I you know. care about Mark Harmon. Otherwise, as far as we're concerned, he died like 15 years I know. ago. He's like, he's, all he does is well, this. He, he, he doesn't do movies. He doesn't do other TV shows, really. He just does NCIS. He married Mindy. I know. Yeah. Uh, and also, fourth season, I don't think this thing's coming back, is uh, NCIS Los Angeles, which is their way of saying NCIS with, um, uh, with uh, a cheaper production because they get to shoot it in L.A. Oh, yes. As opposed to, uh, you know, in North Carolina or right. New York, wherever else they shoot these things. This one was with uh, Chris, o Chris O'Donnell and um, uh, Mr. Mr. J. Oh, uh, uh, LL Cool J. LL Cool J. Mr. J. Yeah, that Mr. was funny. J. That was cute. Uh, this one is uh, horrible. They're both okay. horrible. I mean, come on. <laughs> Stop that. Okay. <laughs> some, uh, some older classic TV stuff. Uh, the complete sixth season of Cheyenne. Which I'd totally forgotten even existed. This is a Warner Archive release because everybody else apparently has forgotten that it existed as well. Um, they claim that Cheyenne is the first viable hour-long uh, drama. I don't know what they mean by viable. Let me see that. Let's what do they mean, viable? I didn't read the back of the box when we looked at it. Um, I sort of find that... Trailblazing TV Western credited as the first viable hour-long drama. What See, I find, that, I find that marketing phrasing very suspect. I don't know what, what they're reaching for there. I mean, I, there were a lot of hour-long dramas, but what do they mean viable? Like, it, they, it made a profit? I don't know. It was It, it lasted longer than, than X number of seasons Hello or something? Hello, Gunsmoke. Anyway, I don't know. Very strange. Anyway, uh, yeah, the uh, the sixth season was second to the last. It, it lasted seven seasons total, and um, it's fine. It's very much like a lot of the westerns of that particular era. It's got a certain melodramatic uh, flair to it, and it's you know it's all about a lawman and blah 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 blah. You know the drill. Uh, the only thing that really distinguishes this is you get some interesting uh, cameos, uh, interesting guest appearances. And, uh, you know, a lot of decent actors from the era. That's, that's not bad. Um, Combat, the fifth season, more of the same. Vic Morrow, always, uh, always watchable. Rick Jason, always watchable. Um, this is on MeTV, by the way, my new favorite network. What is? Combat's on MeTV. On MeTV. We talked about this a few oh, weeks yeah, ago. Oh, yeah, we did. We did, we did. And we got some listener mail about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How much yeah, they yeah. love MeTV. Yeah. No, Combat's me, on that. Yeah, totally. MeTV, the, the, what's the nostalgia thing. Yeah. yeah. MASH, Star yeah. Trek, it's Combat. Great. Anyway, that, smart. That's, a, that's an ongoing concern. And the final season of Family Ties, which uh, is, is not funny anymore by this season. The, the finale was just really... Do you remember the finale to Family Ties? Uh, you know what? I never saw Family Man. Ties. Only on this uh, DVD. Man, watching, this, I, watched the, I watched the finale again, and I just thought, that's just making me sad on a level that's going to require medication of some kind. See, you like, the, you like the microphone. It, li it frees you up to kind of walk around it and you does. can like do a thing, see? It does. And, you. and make faces behind you. There you go. And then uh, the final season of Perry Mason, Season 9, Volume 2. This also wraps things out, although there's no kind of spectacular Perry Mason finale here. 
It's just it just it's just more trials and more of Raymond Burr doing what he does. Uh, but this, uh, you know, the, if you if you like this previous stuff, you'll love that one in particular. And uh, then, Mark, before I release you to uh, talk about the rest of this junk, season two of the uh, science fiction series Time Tracks, uh, which I, I find to be kind of interesting and kind of w- weird in a throwback sort of a way. Um, the uh, the lead character here is a guy named uh, Darian Lambert, who's been sent back in time 200 and some odd years uh, by an evil mastermind, and um, I don't know. It, it, it feels, it's like a, what, what was the recent uh, Joseph Gordon Levitt movie? Looper? The Hoop, Looper. There we go. Looper's that was terrific. It. This is like a really low budget TV version of Looper. Oh, that's terrible. I'd, that's I'd rather terrible. rewatch Looper. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, this, is, uh, this originally was aired in 1994, and uh, I never saw it in 1994. But it uh, it feels very Harve Bennett. It it has that like late late career Harve Bennett. Yeah, I'm gonna, Bionic Man. I'm gonna try to do in the '90s what I did in the '70s, and it just uh, doesn't. I don't know. It, it 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 just it feels dated. It feels really dated. It feels more dated than than a show from '94. It feels as if it were like a like a late 1970s show. But anyway. Um, give it a shot if it sounds interesting, but you know, time travel shows from that era don't feel quite so timely today. Uh, Wade, wrapping up TV, we have uh, the LA Complex, the complete series. Now, the LA Complex is a Canadian show about people trying to make it in LA, which is very strange because uh, the Canadians, as we said last week, make weird, uh, yes, weird, did, uh, yes, uh, weird yes. versions of like you know they're like the retarded stepchild of American shows. Oh my goodness, that was an insult <laughs> to our Canadian listeners, <laughs> of which I believe we have none. Um, anyway, this is uh, this series never really went anywhere. I, I you know, the, I think the problem with the series is that it was probably just too modest. Mm. It didn't really go super pulpy with the soap opera y relationships and, and breakups and right. makeups. It was fairly serious ish, and I think that people were, were kind of turned off by its modesty. Um, I also think that the thing was, which was, it was produced by the guy who did, or actually the woman who did uh, Degrassi High. So you get some of that in there, but right. uh, I just think this thing never really went anywhere. It just, it's like, who cares? A bunch of nobody's doing nothing. Uh, good riddance to uh, L.A. Complex. The Good Wife's uh, the fourth season. This thing just keeps going. Um, Juliana Margulies has really kind of reinvigorated her career as uh, as Alicia Florrick. And, um, you know, as you know, the show is about a uh, woman whose uh, husband gets um, caught up in a scandal. Of, he's a politician and how she reacts to it. Now we're like, you know, three years down the line and there's federal investigations and people's political futures are in doubt and... It's kind of an interesting show, actually. It's uh, 22 episodes, six discs. There are some uh, special features, including deleted scenes. And uh, look, it's nice to see Julianne Margulies back. She's looking great. She's uh, highly acclaimed for the show. It's nice to see that women of that age, not trying to be insulting, trying to be complimentary, women of that age can get good work, of course, on TV, because they're not going to get good work like that in film. Awesome. The Mindy Project, season one is uh, this... Uh... Now, somebody decided... <coughs> I Now, I, I, I missed the memo on this. Yeah. But somebody decided that Mindy Kaling was like the new thing. Uh, I, that I, everybody had to love Mindy Kaling. I know. I, she, I she's in, she's in She's in your uh, your apocalyptic movie, too, isn't she? In uh, the, uh, This is the, the End. This is the End, yeah. I, I, I didn't get that memo. I didn't approve of that memo. And uh, <laughs> I don't get the Mindy Kaling thing. So I don't know. She plays this uh, OGBYN, and she's uh, single and uh, works at a hospital, and she's all crazy and wacky. Oh, my God, all the crazy, wacky lines. I don't find her as funny as everybody else does. I just don't get it. But, uh, look, it's, uh, it's a modest hit, not a super-duper hit. It's really not the hit that um, some of these other uh, Fox shows have been. But, um, yeah, Mindy yeah. Project. Some people like, you know, look, here's the thing. Some people really like Mindy Kaling. Uh, it's, certainly not, it's certainly not in the same ballpark as, like, NBC's Parks and Rec and some of those other sorts of shows. I concur completely. But uh, it does have its partisans. You took the words. You took the words right. right out of my uh, my hand. Uh, Southland, the uncensored fifth and final season. It ain't that uncensored. It's just some language. Uh, 
Which, does, which isn't even all that shocking anymore if you're watching anything on HBO or, uh, or Showtime. Um, Southland's a good show, uh, but not any more remarkable than any, a lot of other cop shows. Uh, it's certainly, you know, as an L.A. show, we relate to it on a certain level. It's like, oh, I know that place. I've seen cops doing that. Oh, I've seen a beatdown just like that. Uh, but it, uh, otherwise, it's, uh, you know, this has been a good series. Uh, five years, I think, is about long enough for this thing to have run. And uh, this is the... Uh, the final ten episodes of the fifth and final season, along with a decent set of extras, which uh, some behind-the-scenes stuff and some unaired scenes, and it all wraps out kind of nicely. Uh, I, I, although I have to say, uh, you know, that little image right there on the cover, not flattering. <laughs> right? Is that C. Thomas Howell? My goodness. Wow. And getting close to the end of the show here, uh, some great stuff from Swedish television from uh, the uh, the Megahertz Networks people, MHZ Networks, Home Entertainment. Uh, honestly, the the, the European uh, mostly crime stuff that these guys are, are finding is just so fascinating to me. It's like all these great foreign language uh, shows from you know non English speaking countries that it, it's just great television. So if you if you don't mind watching some really really great television uh, it, with subtitled. Pretty great. Uh, this is both, these shows are both from Sweden. This is uh, Detective Inspector Irene Hus. I've got in my hands uh, four volumes, each one with three episodes on it: one through three, four through six, seven through nine, and ten through twelve. And uh, the uh, this is really really cool. Angela Kovacs, who I'm not familiar with, is the uh, lead character. She's you know kind of um, she's just a she's just a tough uh, cop lady. She can fight. Um, she runs the violent crimes unit, and uh, her husband is the uh, the sweet guy. He's a he's a, a restaurant guy and a, and a cook, and um, it's she just she goes through these. She what she has to deal with on a daily basis is just the worst of the worst of the worst. Uh, this is done by the same people who did the uh, girl with the dragon tattoo films, and um, it's it's gritty and it's tough and it's really well acted and it's just fantastic. And then uh, episodes one through three and four through six on two different volumes of Annika Bengtsson, Crime Reporter, which is based on the crime novels by an author named Liza Marklund. And uh, this, is, this also very similarly follows kind of a trajectory of a woman who's trying to do, deal with work and with family and trying to balance all the stuff that she does, except it's all crime reporting. It's not, you know, from the cop's point of view. It's from the, uh, the reporter's point of view. And really well written, really well acted, just uh, first rate all the way through. Uh, I, it's just, you know, all this great stuff from Swedish television. We always knew, like, Ingmar Bergman. Swedish television, right? Great stuff. Scenes from marriage. They do really good stuff on Swedish television. But who knew that they had stuff that makes Law and Order look like, you know, a comic book? Well, all, it, it makes the American stuff look very, uh, very um, factory. Just yeah. like factory stamped out. And, and the nice thing, too, is that they go to some really interesting locations here. I mean, like, there's an episode of this one where they go to Spain, you know, and they, they really exploit the European locations. It's not all just sort of stuck in Sweden and, you know, here we are in Gothenburg or wherever and, you know, look at the... Look at the Swedish meatball look world. Look at the cows. Look at the cows. <laughs> We're going to go out into the countryside. No, it's like it, they, they really make... They, they do a great job. They do some really interesting stuff. Uh, all right, Mark. Oh, let's see. We're almost done. You know what? Um... The foreign language film we didn't get to. I want to uh, put my plug in for one other piece from the uh, the fantastic people at Cohen, for whom I did the uh, Bronte sisters commentary. Uh, they have released *The Damned*, the Rene Clément classic French film that is uh, a must-see for anybody who is a fan of post-war French um, cinema. This is one of those great post-war French films that drops in right between the end of the war and the beginning of the new wave. And there's a handful of movies in there, most of them, you know, Melville movies, that just sort of sit in, a, in kind of a non-genre. And this is one of them. This is, uh, this is really an ex- just an absolutely fantastic film. I'm so thrilled they've released it. They've done a beautiful job on Blu-ray. Really great transfer, and uh, it, this is from 1947. A lot of great extras on here. This all takes place right at the end of World War II, and uh, it, it deals with a group of Nazis who, who are trying to get onto a submarine to escape to South America. And um, it's it's really it's kind of an adventure film, but it's also like a psychological thriller at the same time. It just it's such a good movie, and uh, Rene Clément classic. Just great French filmmaker from the era. Does a, a magnificent job. A lot of great extras on here. Uh, definitely check it out. So that's it, Mark. We are done this week. 
And um, wait a second, I have my out. I have my. Uh, you have your outro. I do. Do it's it. Given to us by a by a listener. All we'll right. Say who? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just been jaded. <laughs>